We're so excited that you guys took time out of your schedule to actually be on with us. Kay, Jasmine, Trevor, Heather, Joe, everybody that's involved in this thing, um, and, and everybody that's in the background, man, we are all geared towards helping you guys win. And so we're really excited to do that. Really excited to kind of talk through and share with you. I have so many things to kind of cover. So I'm going to jump in and we'll move along fairly quickly here. Get, just to give you guys a little bit of background here, uh, together with my wife, Tashina Dillingham, like Sean said, I'm Sheldon Dillingham. Together uh, with my wife, Tashina Dillingham, we are the owners of Avatrol Corporation. A lot of you guys have used Avatrol for a long time. Uh, some of you guys I talked to, I know uh, that we're, we're seeing numbers like 28 plus years and 30 something years and all that stuff in the past management industry and a lot of you guys have been using avatrol that entire time so we're incredibly thankful for you guys having done that um and supporting us along the way and know that of course avatrol has been revamped from the ground up and the team has been revamped and all those things so we are heavily geared towards helping you win and if you were a fly on the wall during one of our team meetings or anything else um you would hear us constantly talking about man what can we do to help them win more? Can we create more winning for their business? Uh, can we create more winning in the way that they interact with customers or more sales or more marketing support or whatever it is? So we are geared to help you guys win. When you win, we win. When you guys aren't winning, we're not winning either, right? Like, so we're in your corner, consider us a partner. We really wanna help out. Our teams are structured and motivated to help service providers win bird contracts. Really quickly, I wanna talk just a little bit about what the goal is today. First of all, bird season has begun. That means that there are opportunities all over the place and we wanna help arm you with everything that you need to best take advantage of the opportunity. We're actually gonna talk about a myriad of topics today. Um, and again, I'm gonna move pretty quickly. Now, here's one thing I wanna tell you. We do have the deck available for this as well. Um, and we will get a recording of this session out to you also. If that's something that you're interested in, please make sure that you post there in chat uh, again. Uh, support is standing by and they are, they should be interacting with you and all that kind of stuff on chat. Just let someone know and uh, they will actually make sure that we get that to you. So that way you can share information with their team and all that as well. And you can go back and review it because again, there's going to be a lot of information um, and I highly recommend take advantage, taking advantage of us providing you with that information after or in post once we get done with this. Service brands that work directly with our team see an average increase of somewhere between two and 500% in proposals going out the door, bird proposals going out the door. Um, so the way this is going to hit is it's gonna hit you if you're just now getting into the bird industry, we've got some stuff for you. If you've been doing bird work for years, we've got some stuff for you. Um, but again, you'll wanna consider this a partnership as you move forward. Man, we want to get in the boat with you. We want to help you grow. And so we're going to give you proven principles that we've seen in helping companies grow. Um, and then on top of the proven principles, we're also going to provide you with those steps along the way, walking alongside you down the path to help make sure that you win. On the agenda specifically for today, we're going to talk about some of the types of birds that need control during the season. We're going to talk about talking to some of your existing clients about non-contract opportunities. We're going to talk about how to avoid some dead leads and how not to waste time. We'll talk about asking some of the right questions and setting up the clothes properly. We're going to talk about creating some winning bird proposals, aesthetics, pieces of information that you want in those proposals that are much more likely to communicate for you in your absence as you hand those proposals off. We're going to talk a little bit about taking contracts from, uh, from prospect to propose to close contacts from, uh, uh, from being absolutely cold. And, um, you know, we don't know if they're interested to, hey, they could be interested to, how do we actually make them a lifetime customer? And we'll talk about some best follow-up practices here really quickly. So understand that this season is the season to run after bird opportunities. It is springtime. And so there are a handful of key culprits that you're gonna be dealing with. First of all is pigeon opportunities. There's gonna be a myriad of opportunities with regard to pigeon. And a big part of the reason why, this is a big three that you're gonna be deal dealing with, a big part of the reason why you're seeing these opportunities and why this is such an opportunity rich season is because this is nesting season for these birds. Um, so oftentimes, even if the birds happen to be there at the location, 
all of a sudden they become much, much more visible because you've got nests all over the place there. You've got uh, you've got nestling birds uh, that are converting to fledgings and potentially falling out of the nest. So maybe you've got locations where you've got maybe dead um, nestlings that are laying on the ground and like broken eggs and all sorts of stuff all over the place. And so this spring season has a tendency to be much more visu visu uh, visible to customers. The other part of it is um, across the country, now it's not quite as cold as it was. You're going to start to see these flocks of birds, some of the birds that will start to migrate back in. Um, so you may have a space where it was vacated from birds before, but, but now all of a sudden these birds are starting to come back in. So you've got pigeons, our big three pigeons, sparrows, house sparrows, and starlings. Those are our big three right now that you're going to be dealing with, and they're going to comprise the bulk of the opportunities during this spring season. And I talked about bird nesting. So this is what I was kind of highlighting. Like what we've got on the screen right here is a pigeon nest, pretty loose nest. They're not super particular about where they place those nests. Um, you will find, in fact, uh, pigeons are about the only one of these ones that we're talking about that are known to breed year around. So, you know, you might actually see them late fall or something as well too, but you see the majority of their nests happening during the season. Those nests could be on the ground, they could be on ledges, uh, they could be all over the place, but it gives you an idea of essentially what, what type of nests we're looking for as we're, um, as we're looking around and we're seeing nests and where we might see them in a little bit more open spaces. The next nest that's gonna be really common and a bunch of you guys, you guys can blow up the chat right now if you guys are seeing this in your area, but um, man, uh, house sparrow opportunities. And oftentimes, because house sparrows are cavity nesters, you're seeing them, you know, again, in, in some of this lettering uh, at some of these commercial shops where there's a cavity in the O or the R or the A or some other areas like that where they're, you know, tucking some of those nests and nesting material and all that kind of stuff uh, uh, and accumulating bird detritus right inside of some of those areas. Very, very visible, oftentimes very visible as the customers are walking in. And then you're also seeing starling nests as well. You're seeing those cavity nests. You're seeing ventilation there on the left. You can see that uh, ventilation uh, where you are potentially bidding heat and some other things there. And now we've got this bird detritus in there. Now it's going to start to get a little bit warmer. Some of the temperatures, depending on where you are in the country, we're talking about fire hazards and a lot of other things during that time. Um, but again, these are the types of opportunities that you're seeing right now. And this is, again, a very opportunity rich season. So where to knowing where to find this stuff is really, really important. Again, when we're dealing with pigeons, what you're not going to do is you're not going to see a pigeon nest that's tucked into some really tight cavity that's that's uh, really condensed. So again, think about like I was talking about that lettering for the signage and that kind of thing. Those nests are not going to be there. Why am I talking about where to see these opportunities and how to actually understand what you're looking at. Well, if you understand what you're looking at, you'll understand even in the absence of the birds being physically present, you'll start to understand what type of bird is potentially there, what type of bird is potentially causing the problem. You know, so if you're walking up to an area and you see this nest that's tucked into this, you know, uh, uh, into this decorative roofing, uh, that's up there, the ridge lines uh, uh, that are up at the top of the roofing, or maybe some of the ridges, uh, let's say on a corrugated metal building, like a warehouse building. Understand that what you're not looking at right there in that sort of upside down horseshoe shape is not a pigeon nest. You're actually seeing some other type of bird. Again, these pigeon nests are gonna be um, a little bit distraught, you can see that they vary in sizes. You know, it's not, they're not huge nests. They're not small nests They're somewhere in between. They could be pretty loose and it could be on ledges. It could be on the ground. Um, sometimes I'll even see these nests on top of like, you know, HVAC units, you know, ones that are not being used regularly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But usually it's gonna be a little bit flatter spaces is where you're gonna find these pigeon nests. Whereas opposed to the house bird nests, like you see there, you're, we're looking at these tight cavities. So again, um, if we're dealing with, you know, uh, various blocks with decorative uh, 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 either designs or lettering or something like that in there. Um, really tight spaces, really compact spaces is oftentimes where you're going to find these nests. Think about um, if you're in a parking lot, and some of you guys may have seen this before, and you've got the lights in the parking lot, and maybe you've got the utility access panel uh, that's there. Uh, that maybe sits, you know, three feet or so off the ground or so. And maybe uh, the maintenance guy forgot to put that utility access panel back. And all of a sudden you'll walk up to it and look in there and you'll see a nest tucked in there. That's likely a sparrow nest. These nests are usually not gonna be insanely high up off the ground. 
we're usually talking somewhere between three and maybe 12 feet, 15 feet, somewhere in there. Uh, we're going to see it could be could be up to 20 feet or so, somewhere in there. But you're going to see these tight, compact, smaller nests that are tucked into these tight spaces. It's going to key you in. Hey, man, this location likely has a house sparrow issue or you could be dealing with starlings. Now it's the same thing. Starlings are cavity nesters as well, but the nest, instead of staying small, tight and compact, compact um, it expands on the inside of the cavity. Uh, so you might be talking about something like, uh, maybe I've got a parapet ledge um, and I've got various joists and some things that are actually holding that up. And in that tighter area, I'm actually gonna have a nesting deposit. But when I look back in there, or if I got it, it's almost similar to like a rat's nest or something, right? When I get back into that nest really expands out quite a bit potentially. Um, that's what I'm dealing with when I'm dealing with the starling nest. Now these might be up to 50 feet plus high up, up in the air and they could be pretty low. You can see, you know, we've got that, uh, we've got that outdoor grill that's on display that also has a starling nest built um, into it. How are, what are those starlings doing? Well, they're probably flying in through a cavity somewhere, maybe open on the back, maybe open on the side, coming up through there. They're building their nest in there. They're probably not building that nest uh, with the lid open the way that it is now, that lid's probably closed and they're basically building that nest in, getting in from somewhere and coming up and actually putting that nesting material in there. Or like the bottom, the picture you've got there on the bottom, uh, bottom right there, where you've got some juvenile starlings that are in there. That's likely some type of a decorative, like rock meets concrete sort of wall that's there for some type of, uh, for some type of shopping center or something like that. A, a decorative feature. Again, it's pretty tight, but the space is fairly large large enough uh, for a starling to actually start to build the nest and expand the nest out. Again, why am I talking about, uh, you know, these nest types and, uh, and where to find them and how to identify them, all that? Again, when you show up at a location, oftentimes, or if you're looking for opportunity, it's not just looking around for wings flapping everywhere. It's also looking around, being observant and saying, hey, let me think like like a pest for a minute. Let me think like, let me have a bird brain for a minute here and think like a bird. Um, where exactly would I place X? Where would I place nest? Where would droppings be? Where is food, water, and harborage? Remember, those are the three things anything needs to survive. What am I going after? If I'm asking myself those questions, whether it's an existing account when I walk in the door, or if I'm asking myself those questions, um, if it's a brand new account, and maybe it's the first time I'm observing it or whatever, maybe I got called out to actually uh, come take a look and get, put a bid on, on like roach work or whatever it is, right? If I keep my head on a swivel, my eyes up, I know what I'm looking for, I'm also finding some additional opportunities. There's nesting, there's nesting, there's nesting, here's this, here's this, here's this. Hey, I think you guys may also have a bird problem, right? So it gives you the opportunity to propose something additional. Here's something really cool for you. And again, blow up the chat if this is something that you want access to. Again, we have uh, we have a deck uh, uh, built out for this that you guys have access to, but this is the bird opportunity ranking system. Here's what we've taken some time to do. Our team blew this away, support team blew this away, putting this together, pretty incredible. But essentially what, what we've done is we've taken the industry across a bunch of the umbrella industries and how this breaks out. And we've broken out the rating. So you get to the industry on the left, in the middle, that's the rating for the season. So spring, you can see, so the, the highest rating is five. So it's rated on scale of one to five. You can see in spring that hospitals, there's a lot of opportunity for. Uh, uh, grocery retail, gas stations, play. This is all, these are all kind of places where there's a high degree of opportunity during this season. And then we also uh, took that a step further in the far right hand column you've actually got uh, stars. They're ranked by stars as well too. Uh, so you can choose. Now, here's what's cool. And again, if you want access to this, just put it in the chat and we'll make sure we get you access to this. We don't just have this for spring. We have this for the entire year, for every season of the year, where your biggest opportunity is. This is absolutely priceless if you're going after opportunities. Now, here's what we've done with the year one. Um, we've also added a fourth column out there for you, and it is overall ranking. So if you're looking for opportunities that maybe you can follow year around, like, hey, what can I go after summer and spring and fall and whatever, right? Um, it's actually ranked by that as well. And so you can get in there and say, 
man, hey, it looks like that, you know, uh, you know, retail garden centers or something like that has an opportunity rating of, you know, 4.2 year around. I think I'm going to put a lot of, you know, a lot of effort into that. So we have an expanded version of this as well, too. Again, our goal is to try and provide you with some significant and overwhelming and lasting value. So please blow up the chat, let somebody know. We'll make sure we get that to you after this is over, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, Let's take a minute to talk about talking to your existing customers and identifying some of their pain points. Now, here's something that we've done. We've broken it down. It's like, what's the reasons that we need to control birds? We've broken it down into three reasons. The three Ds, disease, destruction, and distraction. Those of you guys who have maybe taken time to go through our certification training have likely heard that already. Disease, destruction, and distraction are three reasons why anyone should take care of bird issues. Now, what you wanna do is key in on one of those three issues if you're having a conversation with a customer so you can truly understand what their pain point is. And every customer doesn't necessarily have the same pain point. Now, there are some similarities across industries, but every customer doesn't necessarily have the same pain point. So here's the thing. Well, here's something that most customers don't understand, that birds carry and transmit over 60 different types of diseases. Most of you guys, of course, in pests are navigating rodents, and you guys are familiar with the number that um, rodents carry and transmit roughly around 35 different diseases. So now we're talking about a bird uh, who transmits almost twice as many diseases as rats and mice and travels over a significant different distance uh, uh, by comparison to rodents as well too. Oftentimes expressing that to customers and helping them understand um, is something where they go, wow, like I had no idea. Again, um, oftentimes there's a little bit of a disconnect between the general public and how they view birds versus uh, the dangers that are actually caused by pest birds. We don't have that sort of natural reaction. It's like people see roaches and they go, oh man, that's disgusting. Like, I don't want that anywhere near me. Or man, that rat looks mean. He looks like he's gonna bite me. I don't want rats near me um, or something like that, right? While simultaneously, it's like they see birds and they might think, you know, home alone bird lady or something like that or, or whatever, right? Um, so again, we, we have to bring something to the table to help them understand and create urgency to take care of the problem. If I'm dealing with a hospital location, like I was talking about the rating for a hospital, they understand disease transmission. I'm going to have a conversation with them, uh, uh, keying in on some pay points and determining whether or not disease is something that they're currently uh, uh, that they're currently combating. Safety measures, something concerned about. I can guarantee you, if I'm keying in on that with somebody in facilities, and then the director of facilities there at a hospital location, that is going to resonate with them, and I have a much more chance of getting my foot a lot further in the door, having a conversation with, about disease and something else. Now, I said there were three. Distraction is the next one. This this one is the one that you guys, a lot of times you're getting calls about already. This is kind of that factor where it's aesthetic. Customers are walking in, there's nests that are there in the signs. Uh, we don't like the way these nests look. Uh, this is disgusting. There's droppings all over the ground when our customers walk in. We don't like them having to walk. Our customers are getting droppings on their clothing, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and oftentimes here, this is one where you get your foot in the door, but then tie it in with something else. Don't don't expect this one to sell the job for you, but if it gets your foot in the door and you get a call about it, then it's like, okay, great. Is there, are they concerned about disease? Are they concerned about destruction? What can I key in to actually add some value to it? Here's the reason why we wanna do that. Oftentimes the cost of a bird proposal is, is significantly different than some of the other recurring pest work that they're used to paying for. So if we haven't created enough value on the front side and I properly identified their pain point on the front side and expanded their knowledge on the front side, they're going to take a look at that proposal and then go, wow, you want this to take care of the birds, but I pay this to take care of my other pests currently. How about no, right? And then maybe they shop around and then they're still like, well, how about no? Everybody's, the price is still high. I didn't realize that bird stuff was this hot, right? So we have to tie in some of the other Ds to some other reasons to create emergency to get them to actually take care of it. Um, the analogy that I like to use here is uh, it's it's a little bit like, uh, let's, let's use our hospital. We were talking about it before. Let's say we've got a designated parking area inside of our hospital garage. Um, and we have the, the guy that runs a place or whatever. Uh, that is pulling into his designated parking space every day inside of that garage. And let's say we've got a pigeon infestation above and he's parking his nice S-class there. 
And every day when he comes out to get into his car, his car is covered in bird droppings, right? So he talks to his facilities guy and he's like, this is insanely aggravating. Do something about these birds, right? So facilities guy calls someone out and says, hey, what can you do? And and they go through and they, you know, they give him a proposal. Now, here's the thing. That is the aesthetic factor. We've got droppings on a car. It's frustrating for him because there's droppings on a car. He's not necessarily concerned going, man, I'm concerned I'm gonna get sick, but, you know, because these bird, this bird droppings are on my car, um, right? And he's probably not thinking about some of the other things associated, right? So if, if we haven't tied anything else in, what we're setting ourselves up for when we hand them the proposal is we're now setting it up for this guy to compare the price of him washing his car on a regular basis to the price of taking care of the birds. We're never going to win in that situation, right? So this is the reason why we don't lie, to rely on the distraction factor to actually sell the jobs. We use it as an addendum. If it gets our foot in the door, use that as an opportunity to tie it in with something else. And the destruction, birds cause billions of dollars of damage every single year. They do it um, all sorts of ways, everything from roof collapses to fire risk, um, et cetera, et cetera. Their droppings contain a heavy content of uric acid, which will eat through most construction materials, steel, concrete, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, right. So the image that's there on the left, this was a uh, this is one of our um, one of our garden center clients. And this is a scenario where, again, we're just keying in on what is the pain point. And I might ask some strategic questions here. It's like if I'm in there and I'm talking to, let's say, a garden center manager, or I'm talking to a store manager, assistant manager. We're looking around, having a conversation. I'm going, man, wow, there's a lot of, we've got a lot of birds, uh, you know, around here. And they're going to say, yeah, man, that's really annoying, you know, blah, blah, blah. They're going to say whatever they're going to say. And then I might ask something like, man, like uh, I'm noticing, I'm seeing droppings on on some of the stuff that you've got out here. Um, is that a is that a problem? I'm asking some key questions. And they're going to say whatever it is they say. Yes, no, maybe, whatever, right? But it's like, man, yeah, it is or no. I'm going to then ask what they do with that equip with that stuff that's sitting out there once it gets the droppings on it. Oh man, um, if it's we throw it out, great. There are tons of statistics on inventory shrinkage. I mean, we're we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars across brands for inventory shrinkage. If they're happening, either throw it out or replace the packaging or whatever. Right? It's great. I get the key in on that. He gets to save money on the on the bottom line. What did I just tap into? Well, now I'm not talking about aesthetics. I'm not talking about customers getting droppings on their clothes. I'm talking about them saving actual tangible dollars on inventory shrinkage at that point. Right? Or if they're like, well, we take time to clean it off. It's like, wow, man, there's quite a few droppings out here. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff out here on these packages. I'm curious, like, about how much time does it take to to clean some of this off, you know? And then he's gonna talk about it. He's gonna say, yeah, my my guy's out here, you know, cleaning this off like three times a week or whatever, you know? I'm gonna, and then I'm, you can see how that, how I can kind of keep that ball rolling by just asking the right questions. If I continue to ask the right questions, eventually I'm gonna be able to position them to understand the dangers that are caused by pest birds and some of the potential for additional damage that's there. I'm building up the value, knowing the end destination that I need them to close. I'm gonna get them a proposal. The proposal's gonna back up what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna key in on those pain points later on down the road, right? This is also part of the reason why having a great CRM matters. I highly recommend if you're on the phone with these guys, you're talking to these guys, if you're talking to them in person, obviously I know you can't, you know, you're probably not going, uh-huh, 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 and jotting stuff down, but man, hold, hold on to the key things. And it's like the minute you get out to the service vehicle, man, whip out that CRM or, you know, pull your phone out or whatever, you know, that, get those pain points in there, man, because you can continue to key in on that throughout the process as you're going to sell and try and get this job closed. And ask some key questions. Does this account currently deal with any particular pest? Like, are there already account, are, are there already pests? Are they dealing with ant problems, roach problems, all of that kind of stuff? Because my next question is, is the pest associated with this account potentially being deposited there by birds? So I'm thinking about things like ectoparasites, ticks, fleas, et cetera, et cetera, that are attaching themselves to the bird. And then when the bird lands, those ectoparasites then are transferring into the location. That gives me an opportunity to talk about the birds as well. Also, I'm 
I'm asking myself the question, is there a risk of zoonotic disease transmission by these birds, you know, through the means of like the the uh, the insect transmitting it to the, or sorry, the bird transmitting it to the insect, the insect transmitting it uh, to the person or vice versa. There could be multiple areas that this goes in, but think about um, West Nile virus, for instance, um, and um, in mosquitoes. The, the only reason why it's thought that West Nile virus is here in the States in the first place is because of birds. So the way it works is that birds are actually carriers of the virus. The mosquito bites the bird, the mosquito then bites the human, the human contracts West Nile virus, uh, and that's a massive issue. So what I'm looking for is, man, okay, I'm out here to, to navigate this, this account. Maybe I sold the mosquito account and I get called out to actually take a look and give a bid for some mosquito work. I'm also looking around for signs of other things like, huh, I think they've got a bird problem. Mosquitoes, birds, that's a bad mix. I probably need to go ahead and talk about the three Ds, create some context, key in on this. The, I guarantee the customer is gonna be like, wow, I had no idea that West Nile virus was a, was a risk here because we have birds and mosquitoes present, right? Um, I'm also asking myself the question, what are some of the biggest areas of concern with the existing pest infestation that they're dealing with? What are the pain points there? They, if I key in on their pain points for what they called me out for in the first place, it is very easily going to open the door for me to talk about other things. If they're concerned about inventory shrinkage because of uh, because of something else that they're dealing with, you know, let's say it's food processing or something, I'm really concerned about contamination with Indian meal moth or whatever. But simultaneously, I've also got birds that are here. I can address inventory uh, uh, damage and shrinkage contamination, I can actually tie birds into that. I can tie every other pest that I want to tie into it and I can create some urgency for them to actually move forward with taking care of the entire thing. And I'm also uh, asking myself the questions the customer know where to look to identify bird issues. Oftentimes a customer may walk past a bird issue and not recognize where that issue could actually lead to. So for instance, who thinks about the weight of bird droppings? Well, here's what I can tell you. A single pigeon produces about 24 pounds of droppings a year. So if they've got an infestation of about 100 pigeons, that's like 2,400 uh, pounds of droppings a year uh, that's, that's being accumulated across that flock. So now think about um, uh, some of the scenarios that we've had to deal with gas station awnings that you know are collapsing or the parapet walls are starting to bow out or roof collapses at warehouse locations um, because the droppings are acidic and simultaneously those droppings are also heavy uh, over time and it starts to you know collapse structures. Oftentimes as a customer is walking past it, they may see droppings, they may see birds, they may think it's a minor annoyance, but if you can actually show them where to look for key issues and then demonstrate to them why that could turn into a much larger problem, it's much, much easier to get them to move forward to actually take care of the problem. Let's talk about dead leads here, the dead leads here really, uh, really quickly. First of all, a couple of things that I'm thinking about with regard to dead leads is how long does it take a particular type of customer to close on some of their other pest services? So as you go out there and you propose, this, taking care of this, or taking care of this, or taking care of this. It's like, man, on average, does it take them a year to make a decision? Does it take them two years? Like everything you've ever sold, does it take them two years to make a decision, right? If that's the case, here's the way we're looking. I'm not saying don't run after those leads, but here's what I'm saying. Look at it a little bit like uh, 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 like circles. We, we talk about this all the time internally, where it's like, man, our inward circle is our low hanging fruit in here. And then the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Focus on that low hanging fruit. Go after those as many of those as you can, and then work backwards, and then work backwards, and then work backwards. That's going to help make sure that you're using that time efficiently as you navigate from one account to the next. Also, what is the customer's budget? Are they maxed out on budget? Um, this is not as hairy or as sticky as a question as you might think it would be. Now, it may take some feeling out. Obviously, it's going to take some trust. You're going to have to establish a relationship. You can't just say, hey, what's up, man? My name is, you know, Sam. Um, how's it going? What's your budget to take care of pests for this year, right? With no relationship. It's like, get out of here, right? So you're going to have to form some relationship and all that kind of stuff first. But let's find out, man. Also, if they're maxed out on other stuff that's not non-contract, I'm going to probably wait strategically. I'm going to wait for maybe a budget refresh. I'm going to ask that question. 
man, like, are you guys on a calendar fiscal year? Like, how, how is your fiscal year actually set up? Well, it's set up this way or it's set up this way. Okay, great. That it sounds like that's probably when you get fresh budgets. Yeah, it is. I actually get a new budget in July, right? I think sometimes what we run into is guys that will also make assumptions of like, man, okay, he told me that he can't actually take care of it until next year and they take it literally. They're like, oh, man, okay, I guess I got to wait till 2023. Well, no, he may actually be referring to when they get their fresh budget, which could actually happen next quarter, right? So make sure you ask some clarifying questions and kind of dig in a little bit. Um, and then also ask the question, how does the customer currently handle other non-contract issues that they might have show up at their location? Um, if it's if it's ridiculous, you know, moving heaven and earth to try and make anything happen, like if you've had to propose anything outside of non-contract, again, I, that doesn't mean I'm not gonna pursue something, it just means bump that out a couple circles, right? And then let's focus on the stuff that's that's really, really hot and then we'll get to warm and then we'll get to cold and then we'll get to like frigid, right? Um, so that's the way you wanna kind of look at that. Um, how urgently does the customer take care of their current general facilities issues? This is really important. So if, you're, if you've been walking into a location for the last year and there's a door that's hanging off the hinges and it's been hanging off the hinges for the last year, or if it's a, a, a location that you've suggested um, doing something to, that's actually my next point, doing something to like, man, you know what, actually, if you, if you do this, you could really, how about you clean those grease traps, right? If you clean those grease traps more often than you want, and man, you guys can blow up the chat right now, because I know there's probably a chorus of amens uh, from you guys around, especially uh, those of you guys with restaurant clients, and I can even we're suggesting something, and it's like the customer's just doing nothing, they're doing nothing, they're doing nothing. Um, chances are, if they're not navigating current facilities issues very well, um, I'm probably not putting these guys in my innermost circle. I mean, unless they're going, hey, we really need to do something about the, these birds. Uh, we have an inspection coming up or something like that, right? Um, otherwise, what, what it's gonna tell me is that like, if they're not taking care of, of the facilities currently, there's no one of the 3Ds that I'm probably gonna key on that's gonna motivate them to, to move forward any faster than the pace that they would currently move forward. Uh, right, so then I'm also, uh, the last thing I'm gonna ask myself is, do they have currently have a bird issue or am I trying to persuade them with prevention in mind? Understand it's much, much easier to actually sell this if they have a current pro, uh, problem rather than it is trying to help them pre prevent having a problem in the future. Again, this doesn't mean that I'm not going to ever do it. Um, it does mean though, I've got to understand that there, uh, I am lengthening the amount of time that it's going to take for this location uh, to close by uh, by talking about preventionary measures and like all of that kind of stuff. I really want to key in my hottest stuff is going to be stuff that has a bird problem right now. The other thing that I want to mention is you want to make sure that your proposal is doing the selling for you. Really, really important. So here's the thing to understand as you're navigating, and oftentimes you guys have run into this already. You may have a conversation with a facilities person, facilities manager, could be a plant manager, could be a store manager, whatever, right? Um, they may not be the one who makes the final call to approve the work that happens, right? So then the question is, how do I influence the president of whatever this is or whatever, or the vice president or the region manager or whoever is the guy that actually has to underwrite my proposal? How do I influence him to move as quickly as possible if I'm not in direct contact with that guy? I'm only in contact with this guy over here. Here's what I don't need to do. I don't have to turn my facilities manager into a freaking bird expert. I don't have to turn my store manager into a bird expert. What I need that guy to be is I need him to be an evangelist. I need that guy to all of a sudden say, wow, we're oh, birds of the devil, right? <laughs> like we're gonna go like Adam Sandler, like water boy on this or something. But I'm, he's going, man, birds of the devil, um, you know, like we have to do something about this right now. This is the most important thing. I need that guy uh, to, to be in that position. I don't necessarily need to play the telephone game and have him convey all of the information that I convey to him, to the guy that's further up the chain. I want to let my proposal do some selling for me when I put that in his hands. And what I need to be is I need to be an advocate for my facilities guy or my primary contact 
um, so that we're on the same team. He needs to feel like we're on the same team. Our objectives are aligned. That means I've got to listen really, really real well and respond as he's speaking, um, right? And so he feels like he's got a teammate. He's enlisted. Remember, oftentimes, man, these guys don't get any love either. The facilities guys don't get any love. Um, so it's like, man, I'm going to treat that guy special. I'm going to make sure I take care of that guy. Again, I need that guy to be an evangelist in my corner. Let the proposal do some selling for me. Um, and let this guy basically back my play. That's really what I'm going for here. So I'm not telling you guys to do this specifically, but I wanted to pull the curtain back so you guys have the opportunity to see our proposal a little bit uh, as we sell these bird contracts and then hand them off for service provider partners, uh, certified partners to execute. This is a type of thing that we would put in a customer's hand. Um, so first of all, you can see on the right-hand side, we're keying in on the three Ds, disease, distraction, and destruction right there uh, uh, as to the reasons we're creating some value as to why they need to take care of the bird issue you can see that it's it's pretty it's a pretty easy read it's not intimidating as you as you look at it there it's not like blocks and blocks of text um, we're not also keying in on um you know the hat bird habits and habitats or any of that kind of stuff understanding the customer on the other side um, genuinely probably doesn't care that much about how much a bird sheds during the year, uh, like how they wear mold. Uh, they probably don't care about how many um, nestlings or something like that a bird is going to produce over time. Like, unless I'm making a very key point, like, you know, a couple thousand sparrows, or sorry, a couple couple sparrows, a male and a female can grow to 2,000 plus birds in, you know, three years or so, right? If I'm making that point, then maybe I might include that in there. But otherwise, it's going to be a quick, easy read. Understanding that the guy who's going to make a decision has to look at a lot of proposals um, regularly. From there, I'm going to take some time and break the job down. We're going to break it out in phases. What we do is we break it down into three phases, pre-bait, live bait, and monitoring program is really how we try to break it up. And we just essentially paint the picture and we put that really quickly up in the front so they get an idea of basically what's being done. Now, naturally that person might be a little bit more inquisitive. They might want a little more information. Here's the thing, if I've set this up right with my facilities guy and I talk to him about the proposal as well before he, get, before he gives it to his guy, um, I have an opportunity to also set my guy up who's going to be an evangelist now for me, right? He's the guy who's gonna try and work to get this pushed through with his contact. I have armed him with information. Like if he's going, okay, um, if he's going, hey, uh, what about more information? What about whatever? I'm gonna walk him through and say, hey, this is where you can find more information on this proposal, right? And a breakdown there. So we break the price down, we do all that kind of stuff in there. And then on top of that, then we take some time to break down the control system. We take some time to actually build value. Now, also think about the placement. First of all, we're talking about the dangers and building some, um, building a little bit of urgency on the front side. And then we're actually talking numbers. We're not forcing them to read through a bunch of gobbledygook to start with. Um, first of all, we're getting right to it so they can see the numbers. And then if they're curious about what the next piece is, now we get a chance to build a little bit of value. We get to show some past successes. We get to do that. And then we're actually showing how the process actually works. We've got some product. We're actually making statements like in partnership with manufacturer, et cetera, et cetera. So now, because uh, here's the thing to keep in mind. Um, we all know in the world of automotive repair, right? Um, if you take it to the manufacturer to get the work done, the price is probably going to be higher. Why is that? Because the manufacturer does it right the first time every time. That's generally how the general public looks at it. I'm not saying that that's 100% the right view. I'm not even saying that that mirrors all of your experience, right? But as a general rule, that's the way they look at it. Well, now, you've got this opportunity to put something in their hands in partnership with manufacturer, all of that stuff, right? And it builds some value um, showing that, hey, man, it's not just this, it's actually backed by uh, backed by more party than, than just what's being uh, placed in front of me. So highly, highly recommend breaking down your proposal in this way. Um, this is what we've seen work and be very, very effective. Not saying that you need to retool everything, uh, but if it's not this way, I would take a hard look at it and, and try and put yourself in your in your customer's shoes and particularly the customer that you haven't talked to, the one that's actually underwriting the project and go, 
if I was that guy, would I actually go for this based on the information I'm looking at, not based on my facilities guy bringing it to me, based on the information I'm looking at? If the answer is no, it's time to go back to the drawing board. The one thing that I wanted to tell you guys as well, um, we offer a, uh, this is a free uh, software called Proposal Builder. And essentially what it does is if you want something like what, and you could just blow up the chat or whatever, put it in there, we'll make sure you have access to this. But basically, if you want access to that, you're essentially just saying, hey, I've got this bird type as a problem. I have this number of birds. It will actually spit out a proposal for you, just like the one that you just saw, the one that I just stepped through. Um, and we make it really, really easy for you. Um, so again, we want to try and make tools available for you as you're going through. And then you can choose. You're like, man, you know what? I wanted a price to plug into my proposal. Great. You can do that. Or, man, I really want to run with, with this proposal and put this in the hands of my customer. I like this better than what we've got currently. Do that. Or I want to give them my proposal and this one right next to it in the numbers match and all that stuff. That's great. Whatever you want to do. But again, we want to try and make it easy for you. All right, let's talk about closing here really quickly um, and talk about the how. There are a couple things that we're asking as well. I'm asking, who are we giving this to? Who gets the information is critical. I've kind of keyed in on this. Um, yes, the facilities guy uh, uh, might be getting the information, but who's the end guy? And I can ask that too. Don't be afraid to ask that question. That's really important. It's like, if I've been in conversation a bunch with a facilities guy and I've got a relationship built up, like, hey, I'm gonna get a proposal for you. Um, by the way, is it, is, are you the one that approves that or does it go up the chain or you know what, how does that work? Well, actually my VP of whatever is actually the one that signs off on all of these. That helps to give me some perspective and helps to set myself up to win when he goes to hand that information off. Also, I'm asking, how are we getting this information to them? I like digital transmission um, when we're getting proposal, proposals in people's hands. I talked about a CRM earlier. If you, if you don't have one that allows you to send proposals that you can track, I would highly recommend making the investment in a CRM that does that because it will allow you to actually sh to see how many times the customers opened it, who it's going to, all of those things, what pages they spend a lot of time viewing, et cetera, et cetera. What, why does that matter? It's gonna help you better key in on pain points. It's gonna help you with your follow-up. It's gonna help shape your verbiage, all of that kind of stuff. It's really, really critical. So I recommend doing that. And then I'm asking, how are we following up? The question is, did I set the next appointment? Here's what I don't recommend doing. Handing your proposal to a guy or sending it to a guy and then being like, great, you know, we'll hear from you when you, just let me know when you're ready to go, right? Like, that's not gonna work. Instead, I'm going to try and set up some expectations. I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to get this proposal over to you. Um, and then I'll, uh, how about I check on you, you know, some like on Tuesday around 10. How's that? How's that work? Right. But I'm going to try and set up the next appointment every single time. Set up the next, set up the next and set up the next and set an expectation. Now, when I'm going to get back to that guy, there's a couple things that I've done, right? It's Thursday. If I'm today, literally today, if I'm talking about Tuesday, A, that guy feels an expectation now that he has, he needs to have looked at that proposal before we touch base next. And then B, he has an expectation that I set up something and now we've got something on the calendar. I'm probably gonna send a calendar invite to him for 10 a.m. on Tuesday. We're gonna to touch base. We're gonna look at the proposal. And I might even talk to him, hey man, I'd love to actually, I'd love for you to take a look at the proposal and then I'd love to walk through some things with you. How's Tuesday at 10 now? Man, that, that, that sounds great or that doesn't work or whatever. But I've set up the next. I don't just wanna hand it to him and leave it open um, ended. And then the next thing that I'm thinking about is, um, what expectation did I set up on the last call moving forward? I'm just asking this, what expectation am I gonna set? There's never a call that I go into where it's not intentional. I wanna go here and then I wanna go here and then I wanna go here or whatever. Going into these calls without intention is like going, hey, here's what I wanna do. I wanna drive uh, coast to coast here and I'm gonna try and do this without a map. I'm gonna try and do this without GPS. I'm just gonna go, right? Uh, that's probably gonna end badly. You wanna make sure that you've got a plan. Um, the last little piece of this here, and we're going to wrap up, is we want to finish the deal and understand that the deals that you carry through that you're intentional with in this way have the highest chance of going your way. So continue the momentum as you're looking to close. 
don't get discouraged. Remember, if it's not a no, then it's a yes. Just do that in your mind. Man, they haven't said no. They haven't shut me down. They haven't said we never want to do this. They haven't. So it's either maybe a no for now, right? Uh, okay, so great. We're going to carry this forward, which is a yes. That's how I'm going to translate that. Or it's a somebody's thinking about something. Somebody is mulling something over. Let me let me have some more conversations. Maybe there's some more setup I need to, et cetera, et cetera. But don't get discouraged. Anything that's not a no is a yes. And then don't push it. Move forward at your customer's pace. You want your customer to feel like they're in control. So yes, I'm setting up the next, but I'm only doing so because they keyed in on what their pain point is. If I don't understand their pain point, there's no way I can create a winning team between the two of us. There's no way that I can create an active relationship between the two of us because I don't understand their pain point. I'm not on their team. I'm talking one language and they have no idea. They're like, it's Greek to me. I don't, I don't get what you're saying, right? So don't push it. You maintain control, but let your customer feel like they're in control. That's the way that you want to establish this. And then don't forget that you're the, you're the expert. That doesn't mean that you never say, man, I don't know. But it does mean that if you say, I don't know, it means you follow that up with, I have a plan, right? I don't know, but I do know that blah, 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 blah. I'm going to get that for you by this afternoon, right? They know that you have a plan and then deliver, man, over, uh, uh, under promise and over deliver every single time. I'm going to get it to you by this afternoon, get it to them two hours earlier, right? You want the customer to go, wow, if they're this responsive right now during this phase, what's it going to be like to be their actual customer? It's going to be incredible to be their actual customer or to add this service on or whatever. This is amazing. I'm having an amazing experience. And then keep them in the yes zone. Keep them at, keep asking questions that get them in the rhythm of saying yes. And these are just basic, easy questions. Is, is, is this a problem for you right now? Yes, it is. Um, do you feel this way about it? Yes, it is, right? Just get them in the rhythm of saying yes, right? We're kind of psychologically getting them in the rhythm of saying yes. And then think through what some of the possible conversations are and have a plan before you walk into every single conversation. And of course, listen closely. Remember, most information is conveyed non-verbally. So oftentimes it's not about what your customer is saying, it's about what your customer isn't saying. This is what anticipation is for, where you're thinking, man, he actually told me this and this and this about the proposal, but you know what? He didn't He didn't talk about price at all. And none of the stuff they told me were objections. And it feels like we're kind of hung up a little bit here. Maybe I need to key in on something. Maybe I need to steer this somewhere, right? Be thinking about that. Listen closely and then key in on things that possibly the customer isn't saying. That doesn't mean create objections out of thin air. I'm not saying do that, right? Like don't create a price objection up front when the customer has it. And don't just assume it's price, by the way. Um, that's what we run into as, as well, you know, where it'll be, man, the customer didn't do it. Well, how come they didn't want to do it? Well, man, it was too expensive. Oh man, what'd they say about the price? Well, they didn't say anything about the price. I just assumed that, you know, it, it was too expensive. Okay, well, like, let's, let's not assume. Let's actually dig in. Let's get some more information. All right, then after they say those magic words that we all love to hear, the words yes, um, get that contract signed ASAP. That means there's some anticipation on the front side. It's impossible to get a contract signed ASAP if you've done no legwork first to make sure the contract is prepped and ready to get into their hands, right? So make sure you're doing that in the background with the expectation of a yes. Make sure that billing has everything lined up so that you can get your initial payment as soon as possible. Really, really important there. Make sure that scheduling and everything else down the line has everything lined up because you want all of what you've sold. Remember, you've sold the customer on you and then you've sold them on the value of your service. If they're the customer bought you, you want everything they experience to line up with everything that you've sold them on the front side and you've sold them you and your excellence, right? So you want excellence to be everywhere, all up and down the line, all right? Then check in with them after the first service, make sure they've had a seamless experience, make sure that the excellence of the service matches up with the excellence that you presented them with on the front side. It's not uncommon for sales guys and guys that are selling things in general to be afraid of this question. 
How did we do? How was our service? Well, if you're confident that you can correct whatever it is that's going on, and you're truly looking to build a lasting relationship, you've got to ask those questions, being prepared for the tough answers, knowing that, man, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that we make this situation right. Customers don't expect perfection, uh, but they do expect attentiveness, right? Keep the relationship alive with thank you notes, continual follow-up, just man, impress them, continue to impress them and make them wish that every vendor that they ever worked with was exactly the way, treated them exactly the way that you treat them. And that's really what you wanna do as you navigate it. All right, and that's a lot of the key information that I've got for you. I touched on a handful of things and I threw a lot of information at you in a really short period of time. Um, understand that we have additional training tools that flush this stuff out um, and actually delves a little bit deeper than what I can give you in like a 45 or 50 minute session or so. So one of the things that we've got is we've got a certification course and it comes in two different formats. We have a pre-recorded certification course that we call Masterclass uh, that's available, but then we also have a live training coming up that has live question and answer and all of that. That is May 12th. Uh, at 9 a.m. Central. That's an all-day course. It covers everything from bird habits and habitats uh, to how to actually do these treatments, how to execute them. We go deeper into sales and how to navigate that. We actually talk about marketing and how to get more leads in. Um, and on top of that, we've got something like, I think it's 40 states or so approved for CEUs too. So if you're needing CEUs, we generally are able to get them both in the on the wildlife side and on the structural pest side. So highly recommend taking advantage of that. If that's something that you're interested in, please take a moment, um, you know, post that in the chat there. And again, the same person who's been taking care of you this entire call as you've been asking questions and we've been answering questions for you in real time, the same person will go ahead and make sure you get the information for our upcoming certification class. Again, that's May the 12th at 9 a.m. And you'll have the, and we've got spaces limited. I think, um, I think we've got about half the spots still open maybe right now. So space is limited. So make sure that you guys and your team in there and take advantage of some of that additional training. And now I want to take a minute here and it, open it up for some questions. Um, so I'll pause here. I'm going to let Heather go ahead and, and uh, present um, any questions that, that we've got out there that we need to answer. There. Thank you, Sheldon. Uh, again, thank you guys all for joining us today. We're so glad that you did. And we hope that um, you guys learned a lot. And I think if there was an Olympic sport for fast talking, I think Sheldon would probably take gold for the U.S. Auction. Because he, yeah, because he can. He can. He can really deliver. So uh, we hope that you guys learned a lot. But I do have a couple questions I'd like to throw out there for you to answer, Sheldon. Uh, the first one uh, is: Does Avatron get a cut of those proposals? Yeah. So that's a that's a great question. Uh, the it, there are a couple different ways that we actually navigate the proposal side of this. So one of which is you saw the proposal builder tool and I showed you guys that tool. We do not take any cut on any of that at all whatsoever. That is a service that we provide as a manufacturer. We want to help you guys sell more bird jobs. Um, so really what we're looking to do is put tools in your hands that help to give you some quick pricing, give you an idea of how to break that down, give you an idea of how to create value for the customer um, and how to use a winning proposal as you put the proposal in the customer's hands and get them to move forward. So that tool, again, is a completely free tool. The service as far as us bidding jobs and helping you with all that, that is free. That is 100 percent free to you. Um, and so that is just a function of what we try to do. Honestly, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, be shy with this. I'm not going to cower back on this for you. Our intent is to be the best manufacturer that you work with in any field, period. So we want to provide you with as many tools as we possibly can to help make sure that you guys win. And if you're going, man, that sounds too good to be true. You, you guys are giving me like proposals and stuff for free and like all that. I'm telling you, I guarantee you, you're hearing it from me and the buck stops with me um, that we, we don't charge anything for that service and we get no cut on it at all whatsoever. We just want you to win. Now we have a separate service that we offer, um, which is our direct to business service. We do have customers that are direct customers that have needs 
uh, uh, bird needs and that kind of thing. Here's one of the things that we found, and a lot of you guys have found this as well and working with maybe some other manufacturers and stuff out there. There are a lot of manufacturers that are out there that provide you with leads. And most pest guys that we talk to as they pursue those leads, they'll be like, man, it's kind of a crap shoot. Maybe it's 50-50 or maybe I 10% of the leads close or whatever. Most of the pest guys we talk to, those leads are garbage. They don't work, right? Um, because again, how are they qualifying leads? Who, you know, is it, there are lead systems and databases and stuff, right? Where I could just pull a I could I could go, hey, why don't you give me every person with the title facilities manager in this type of industry? Oh, hey, look, it looks like I I can, I now have 50 potential leads. Let me dump this to my guy. So he feels like that's not effort. That's not hard work. That's not excellence. Um, so here's what we do. We take it a step further. Instead of providing you with leads, we as leads come in, we actually close the bird work. So we go through the entire process, we close the work, we get it, we get everything signed, we get them going. And then from that point, we work specifically with certified service providers. So that's you guys, as you take time to go through the certification process and do all that, we work directly with you and we hand those jobs to you after they close. Um, and so, I mean, the, the whole thing, I don't have enough time to go through the nuts and bolts of what that program looks like, but if you are looking to sort of um, uh, add in a significant amount of juice to your, your program overnight, that's a great way to do it because it's like, we can probably just hand stuff to you right off the bat and get you going. So if you're new, newer to bird work, that's a great way to get started. Again, I talked about the certification class, May 12th, uh, 9 a.m. That's a great, great way to go ahead and get started on the track to getting certified and then having those closed jobs handy. Awesome, thank you, Sheldon. Another one is how long um, should it take to close a job? Yeah, uh, that's also a great question. So the time is going to vary. Uh, I wish that I could tell you, hey, man, you know what? From the time proposed, this can take you a week and a half on average to actually close this. It does depend on the uh, it does depend on the industry that you're working with. Oftentimes, oftentimes it does depend on the size of the company. Um, you know, so it, it, understand that if I've got uh, a local restaurant chain or something like that, uh, chances that I get that one to close a little bit faster are probably higher than going after a national, some type of a national account, unless there's some other kind of relationship that's tied with it. So you'll want to understand that. Now, here's the great part. Once I get something going, once I get something going with a national um, chain, um, once I'm in, in the, a service channel database or something like it or a global business services type of database or whatever, from that point, man, it's like, I have a problem. Things just get sent to me. They get sent to me. It's really easy uh, to get it going from there. But understand there's going to be some more setup work if I'm dealing with a large chain than there is with a small chain. Um, again, like I said, it's not about the time to close, to be honest. It's about the volume of the pipeline. That's really what you want. Um, so there may be some deals that take six months to close and there may be other deals that take three weeks to close or whatever. Um, but here's what I can tell you. This is a little bit like watching a pot boil. Um, if you've got five opportunities out there uh, and you're <laughs> and, and that's all you've got, you're going to be sitting there trying to watch the pot boil forever, uh, uh, trying to get that get get that to go through. Um, so, but if you've got 100 or 200 or 400 opportunities in the pipeline, right, you're not watching the pot boil as much. Um, and it's it's something where you can you know sort of take action on. I think too this also is a good opportunity. Sean Harris actually handles our sales team and navigates that part of it. And so I'd love for Sean to kind of key in on an answer for for that as well. Yeah, that that's such a great question. Here, here's what I would say that we offer a lot of free tools as Sheldon was talking about, and the time in, in which it takes to close these jobs. There's a lot of variables in there, but here's what I can tell you that we have proven over the, the last few years, especially if you get our team involved, I can assure you that your deals will move faster mm -hmm. because there's just an element of our team that deals with these every single day. So we have all the different you know, objections in there. We have all the different variables already that we're accounting for. So there's a different level of focus that we can help you have 
when it comes to closing that deal. And there's little things from, it might be the payment setup. It might be the, the arrangements of when you're starting. It might be um, when the calendar year, there's there's a lot of things. So here's, here's what I would say when I heard that question is, get our team involved. Yeah. There is no cost to you to have our team involved. Let our team prove to you um, what we're saying we can do. Um, that's what I say. And if we can't prove it, then hey, Send Sheldon an email and let them know, hey, your team didn't deliver. <laughs> but what I, what I promise you is get us involved uh, and we will help you get more deals across the finish line and get more of them across the finish line faster. So that's what I would say. Absolutely, that's a, that's a great answer. Um, remember that two heads or a multitude of heads is always better than one. And that's really the way that we like to look at it is, man, we're in the boat with you. Again, we want you guys to win. Um, and so if you're out there and you're trying to close these on your own and it feels like it's taking forever, there may just be an angle on maybe that Rubik's cube of yeah. getting things yeah. closed that you just haven't quite turned it there yet. Whereas you, you've got access to a team that has experienced that dozens, if not hundreds of time all, times already. And so we can help kind of turn that for you. So that's, yeah. that's a great point, Sean. I agree with that. Heather? Thanks guys. Um, one question. What birds can I use Avatrol with? We did actually have a question on the live here that, you know, Rhonda's dealing with seagulls in one location. So what yeah. other birds can we use Avatrol? Absolutely. So uh, there are about 12 uh, bird bird species uh, that you can use Avatrol on. Of course, we had the big three. You've got pigeons, sparrows, and starlings uh, that, that are the big three. But then you've also got uh, uh, some birds down the line. So you've got grackles and subspecies of grackle. Um, you've got blackbirds and several of the subspecies of blackbird. You've got cowbirds and the subspecies there. You've got crows uh, uh, as well and the subspecies uh, that are there. And then we've got some additional birds on top of that uh, that require a, a front side permit, a depredation permit on the front side that we do help teams with. So like Heather was mentioning about the seagull thing, um, uh, Rhonda, I think is what you said the name was, Heather, is that yep. right? Yep, Rhonda. Yeah. Yeah, Rhonda, so uh, what I would tell you for sure is that yes, Avatrol as a solution does work on seagulls. Um, we do propose that type of thing at food processing locations. We propose that type of thing um, at uh, garbage processing types of locations, um, near beachfront type properties, all of that kind of stuff. Of course, that does uh, uh, require the depredation permit on the front side. If you're uh, if you're not familiar with navigating that process or, or haven't had to navigate it much in the past, or, or even maybe concerned with the time that it takes to actually get a depredation permit to go through, um, it is something that we've dealt with pretty regularly. So we, we're more than happy to help with that. Um, so Rhonda, if you, I'm assuming you've probably been in contact with someone throughout this, uh, throughout this session. Um, that same person will be in contact with you to talk through any kind of seagull opportunities that you might potentially have. Anything we can do to anything we can do to help out there. Yeah, it's an interesting question because here's a, what else I would say is seagulls seems to be something that over the past few months our team has seen an influx yeah. um, of questions about. So uh, for whatever reason, and this is again why it's so critical I think to have a contact point in our team is. Our team can help you navigate in your region what is is kind of creating the most issues uh, currently. So seagulls is a great one to bring up because it seems to be one that's on the radar for a lot of people right now. Um, so so great question there. But again, uh, leverage our team because we can definitely assist you in bird types, where they are, all those things. Um, so definitely use us for that. Yeah, I, I like I, the thing <clears throat> I like about that point too. And again, this is that whole multiple heads, uh, multiple people being in the boat, there may be something that's in a particular city where it's like, man, we've in the city of Philadelphia, we've yeah. seen a significant, you know, uptick in pigeon proposals. And it looks like they're going through on average 20% faster than they were going through before or something like that. This is the types of key information uh, uh, that we can probably help your team with if you're looking for opportunities and trying to figure out, um, you know, how do I actually find gold? Where do, where do I dig for gold? What what, what is how do I mine for gold here? Yep. Yeah. So yeah. we actually just had a comment from Matthew. He said he's a wildlife control agent in his state, and they deal a lot with Canadian geese. Mm -hmm. And so obviously that federal depredation permit would be needed, but has Avatrol ever been used 
based on Canadian geese? Yeah, that, so that's a good question as well. We usually try to stay away from from some of the larger uh, some of the larger species of bird. So Canadian geese is one that we do try and stay away from. Um, we do believe it or not, uh, we do deal with birds up to uh, probably the biggest size that we're, we deal with that would be depredation permit required or like Muscovy ducks or some things like that. But um, geese, we do have a tendency to try and uh, try and stay away from. Um, as you know, there are a lot of uh, additional options that are out there for navigating geese. Uh, so that is one we stay away from. But I mean, outside of that, it is, you know, Muscovy ducks. We do like feral chickens, um, which is a, a little bit crazy. Places like Hawaii, some of the Caribbean type chains. Um, and actually, I think even in Florida, we deal with some of that a little bit. But but Canadian geese, we do, we do try to stay away from. Yeah. Um, I had a friend send me a photo of a Florida restaurant that was like a plate of really awesome looking food. And then right next to her was like a line of bird spikes. And it was like this beautiful, like beachfront, you know, whatever. And then like this amazing steak dinner and then bird spikes. So if you see those places, let us know because we want to help you get a patrol there. You know, it just seems so weird, doesn't it? That's, that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, we, we want those views to stay beautiful. So let, let us, <laughs> yeah. Let us, let us yeah. Um, one last question. How do we get an accurate bird count? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so again, to key in on sort of the theme of what we've been talking about, these are all things that our team can help with, but I'm going to give you guys also some, a couple of quick tips. One is, um, one is one that you can execute now. Another one is one that you'll execute as you start to accumulate experience. So um, here's the thing. If I show up at a location, I'm going to ask myself, um, how can I essentially chunk this information instead of standing there and going one, two, three, four. OK, I'm going to count all the way up to my, you know, 200 bird infestation or something like right? so the better way to do that is to visually get an idea of what a grouping of those birds look like. OK, I'm going to count out five birds. This is what a group of five birds look like. Now, let me scale what I see across the size of the infestation. Um, and it's like, OK, great. That's a five. Okay, this is what it looks like I've got about 70 birds here, right? That's the way you want to navigate that. Now, the other way uh, that you, you want to navigate that is through experience. Um, and so unfortunately, I don't have any quick tips to get here. But I can tell you that once you start to see enough bird jobs, what you'll start to see is a lot of bird droppings in various places. You know where to look for bird droppings and you'll start to associate the amount of droppings that you see there with the size of the infestation. Um, but here's what I will tell you. I'll give you um, something that will help you right now, even if you're not there where you can sort of, sort of estimate uh, the size of the infestation uh, yet based on the bird droppings. If you're not a bird whisperer yet, um, what you could do um, it, it, or un want to understand in the meantime is that if you show up at a location, you don't see a whole lot of birds, but you see a whole bunch of droppings, know that your infestation is significantly larger than what it seems on the surface. Um, it's not uncommon to deal with, let's say, flocks of starlings or maybe grackles or crows or something where maybe you're coming in, um, you know, at let's say two in the afternoon or something and there's like five or six birds out there. If you look around, you may see a whole lot of droppings. You may show back up in the evening or may show back up at daybreak and there may be thousands of birds out there. Now, why does that matter? Who, who cares about how many birds are in this infestation, right? The reason why it matters is because that is actually going to dictate the price of your baiting proposals. That scales up based on the size of the infestation, it's gonna set your materials. Oftentimes it's gonna set the amount of time that it takes to actually deploy materials and do all of that kind of stuff. And I think there are probably some things that they could work with yeah. with the yeah. team on, on that well, as well. You know, the great news about our product is it's not what I call a bullseye product, which means we don't have to hit that number exactly. We just have to get close. And then we have a pretty, pretty good scientific method once we get close to figure out if the variance is more or less. So again, that's the simplest answer. And I know it's gonna sound like I keep saying it is, leverage our team on these because a lot of the real-time education 
uh, that you can get and experience is actually accelerated significantly yeah. working through our team. Um, they can take exactly where to go. They can look the building with you um, on, on Google Maps and say, hey, take a picture from here and send me what this looks like and I'll help you with that count. There's just yeah. a lot of things there. So um, a great question, but again, don't let the numbers necessarily scare you because there's been many a times when that number starts here and it's higher or it's lower, um, but it doesn't actually change much uh, because of the way our product works. As long as we're close, we can handle a little bit of variance um, and make it a win for both you and the customer. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Again, we're in the boat with you. It's a partnership, man. We want to see you guys win. Don't feel like you have to navigate this stuff on your own. Um, our team, as you see, and as you guys have been interacting, you can see that they're well equipped. Um, we're here to help you for every single need that you might have. And I think, Heather, I think we're, we're at time. We've held them over long enough, I think. Yeah, okay. yep, we are wrapped. Great. Well, hey guys, thank you again so much for being on with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, from the bottom of our heart, truly, um, our desire is to serve you guys in every way that we possibly can. Our team has poured our heart um, into this uh, presentation because we want to communicate from our heart and that we value you guys, that we're listening, we pay attention to the feedback. If we need to make changes, we make changes, babe, but we are absolutely in your corner. We would do everything we can to help make sure that you guys have an incredibly successful spring season, incredibly successful year, and that you maximize the amount of bird opportunities uh, that you've got on the table. So thank you guys yep. so much. And man, go win. Let's have a great day.